You're listening to The Arrow of Time right here on the Musings of a Geek podcast network. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, loud and clear, bright and beautiful. There we go. It it got all it got all fooled up. That one did. In a in a spot of bother. In a spot of bother. A bother spot. Very good. Very good. Let's perform a podcast. Make it sound so technical. I forgot my lines. Well, no. Ah, no podcast. <laughs> And welcome to the Arrow of Time. My name is Matt. I'm Joseph. I am Gabe. And this is episode 124. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. We'll just Confirmed. dub over you, uh, you know, awkwardly if it's wrong. 128.7. <laughs> yes, it's Arrow of Time and somewhat thir- thirds ish. Now, I must say, this, this is a Christmas special. And because it has been Christmas, Joseph, you gave me uh, a very nice gift. I mean, so did you, Gabe. You hated it. Why did you hate it? <laughs> no, no. I, I, Why do I bother? No, it's 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 saying I love both of the things. <laughs> that and the thing that's most relevant to this podcast is is up hanging in my on my wall, and I can't wait to use it in January, starting January. Um, but more specifically, right now. I am drinking from a glass with a TARDIS ice cube in it because uh, this TARDIS ice tray that you gave me. And it's fun because it's like, oh my gosh, clink. Cheers. Like, oh no, I have to save the TARDIS from the drowning in whiskey. (laughs) (laughs) Quicker, quicker. (laughs) Don't worry, doctor, I'll save you. (sighs) See, what's funny is when he bought those, he said these are perfect for Matt. And I guess he was right. Yep. <laughs> I know your predilection for putting cold things into drinks. Yes, I love that. Especially if it's Doctor Who shaped. So thank you very much. Um, yes. So, this Christmas special, right? Mm-hmm. Did you guys see this? I did. <laughs> yeah. With my eyes. Yes. Um, I loved BB-8. <laughs> BB-8 was fantastic. It's funny you mention that because... When I was starting preparing for this podcast, I almost couldn't not think about Star Wars. It's like, normally, seeing the Doctor Who Christmas special is a huge deal. But when there's new Star Wars in the world, it's, it's kind of hard to think about anything but Star Wars. You know, that's kind of funny, because when we were all watching Star Wars together, and all these like you know things were happening, don't worry, no Star Wars spoilers for you guys. Um, I was just like, wow, you know, this is really, really good. The only like thing that would make it better if like the doctor all of a sudden appeared was like, oh hey, I'm gonna go fix everything. <laughs> <laughs> that was more of a Matt Smith move, though. Yeah, that was a. I waved my hand, but um, yeah, the doctor. It would either be Sonic sunglasses or Ugh. just pointing at something <laughs> for a while. But um, yeah, so that I guess that's where the the line in the sand gets drawn. I was just I was watching. I, that's that's what I do basically about everything. I watch it and I go, you know what would make this better? Doctor Who. Except Batman. I don't think that about Batman. So I just I just learned, apparently, in the 2009 Star Wars, during one of the battles, you see R2-D2 flying through, or an R2 robot that's colored like R2-D2 flying on the view screen. And one of the Star Wars... Star Trek 2009. Star Trek, okay. During, uh. one, during one of the battles, we see an R2 robot... Flying across the uh, Enterprise view screen. Ha! Huh, no, I did not realize that. Yeah, it's very. I mean, it's small. It's kind of one of those things where you you have to have somebody else tell you, "Oh, check that out." Mm-hmm. Yes. See, I was always kind of hoping, like in Star Wars, when they go into to warp speed or whatever, and you go, they go through that tunnel, that they would just like 
zoom right past the TARDIS. Go the other direction. <laughs> but uh, that's just a hyperspace corridor, Matt. It's right. not the, the vortex. It is not the time vortex. No, <laughs> there's no evidence that Abrams is a Doctor Who fan. There is not, except for that thing you just said. The closest. <laughs> Wait, no. no, that was our two thing. Yeah, that, that, that was Star, Star Wars Star, Star yes. Wars. The closest thing that we have is in the the Family Guy uh, Star Wars. I think it was the first special, the Blue Vel- Blue Blue Velvet Blue Harvest, where uh, they're actually going in the warp speed, and then it just turns into the opening of Doctor Who, a Tom Baker series, because it has Tom Baker's face in it. It's a hyperspace corridor, yes. Matt. Hyperspace corridor. Get it right. Actually, I don't know if that's right. <laughs> anyway, so uh, see, this is why we lose people. Listening to the podcast because <laughs> I say incredibly wrong things. No. It's my controversial comments. Yes, we uh, we found out today that we lost a um, a fan, or a listener anyway, or, or a listener. Yeah, maybe they weren't a fan. Huh? Oh, I just hate these guys. <laughs> and um, it was it was by something that that Gabe said. However, I think that if they continued to listen to the podcast, they would have realized that not everybody like that's not the soul voice of the podcast and that's what i think that our podcast is kind of neat because we all have different ideas and so ideally there's kind of like a viewpoint for kind of you know for everybody well i made it my goal if i try harder tonight maybe i can lose two listeners let's see let's see how many we can lose (laughs) so anyway we're here for the husbands of river song the husbands of river song yes written by our illustrious leader stephen moffat yes who uh, I really think kind of pick things up as far as Christmas specials and um, things that we enjoy watching. I know that Joseph, you said something. You what did you say once we ended the episode? You're like, I hate Stephen Moffat. He made me love him again. <laughs> well, I didn't go that far, but yeah, I hate, <laughs> I hate I hate Stephen Moffat for making it so hard to hate him sometimes. Yes, so I, I hate him again. So it's a, it's a, it's a loop. <laughs> It's like, an, it's like an abusive relationship. It is. <laughs> because he did a thing, which I basically have been wanting the entire season, after I spent the entire season berating him, and then it's like, oh, here you go, here's your fun romp that fits in one episode. You know, no, <laughs> no weird uh, stretching or compression. Right. Uh, there's still some emotional moments, but, you know, we're not going to drag you down, and instead it's going to be fun times running around. It was, it, was a, it was a really, really fun, overall, really fun uh, Christmas special. What did you think, Gabe? I thought so too. I think it was the special we needed for the time because we just lost Clara again. The doctor's presumably still trying to piece together what happened. Yeah. And um, this was a distraction for the doctor and for us. When the doctor first sees River's face, you know, he lights up and that's fun to see. But like I said, it was, you know, we also are in that spot where it's kind of sad, kind of a, you know, emotional season, emotional few episodes to end of the season. So it was nice to have a little romp to kind of divert us. It, it was. It really was. And the thing that I also really enjoyed was the fact that um, this Christmas special, unlike some of the other Christmas specials that it would kind of compare with, that it's kind of similar things have happened right before it. It didn't have a. Um, it, it didn't really have too much to do with what happened before it, with the season before it, and it didn't really have too much to do with, um, or as far as I know. With uh, the following season, so right. I, I mean, I'm assuming I, there's nothing that is like, oh, by the way, next time. It seems like it's pretty good, goodly sealed off, and we don't have a uh, brooding, sad doctor the whole way. Like as as we got with like you know some David Tennant um, specials or with the, like the Snowman, right? Where you know, he's like sad for a while. Well, I think uh, clearly he was brooding before with the little right. sl- sign on his TARDIS that uh, Carolos will be criticized or whatever. Which I and, loved. Yes. But again, you know, it just right away. So it's probably in the first, you know, less than five minutes that he meets or sees River. And he immediately is, you know, energized and happy and excited. And that is that was good. Yeah. And um, one little bit about... Him having like the antlers, he has those antlers that the best. The, the TARDIS is trying to cheer him up, <laughs> but I love the fact that it's like, yeah, he's he's kind of coming back from everything. They don't address that this didn't happen, but they don't like show it on screen for 
a long time. They don't beat you over the head with it, and I really appreciated that. That's just instantly like into fun, wacky Christmas things. It was not Matt Smith living in a cloud. No. Yeah, I mean, his very first words when he opens up the TARDIS was like, What's on, is there something on my head? <laughs> it's like, Describe it. And then he yeah, berated the TARDIS for putting holographic antlers on his head. And which also is kind of interesting because here, so you brought up River. Here comes a River. And it kind of introduces this whole fact of how the story is going to play out about her not realizing who he is. And uh, which is a complete reversal from the the library episode. Right. This kind of plays out like opposite ways of uh, Silence in the Library, which I just got done watching. And, oh my goodness. If you, if you would like some feels, oh my goodness, watch that one now. Because before, Silence in the Library was kind of the episode where we thought it was like, ah, this is like Moffat's like weakest episode that he's done so far. And, um, at least that was uh, our opinion, or at least Joseph and I's opinion, um, when we first uh, saw it. You can see back to Arrow of Time episode something in the past. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly single digit. I think it was... It made me very, very early. <laughs> yeah, I think it was like getting ready, like, oh, hey, you know, here comes the... The Moffat let, train. Let, yeah, let's review all the Moffat episodes, because he's our new showrunner. Um, but now, going back to it, that is a heavy, heavy episode. Like the Vashna and Arad are like completely like second to like what's going on with with River. So he actually retroactively made that episode <laughs> really, really compelling. There he goes again, making me not hate him. I know, changing actual time, <laughs> <laughs> like a time traveler, Ugh. like a boss. I should not uh, give him more egos. Hmm. Watch that. That Twitter guy goes, hey, I like your podcast again because of all the nice things you said about me. Uh, I mean, uh, Stephen Moffat. <laughs> yeah, I made that joke, too, that it was really Moffat's account. Yes. <laughs> the egos of Stephen Moffat. See, I can't remember which jokes we make off the podcast on, on anymore. It's, it's crazy. So, um, yes. So you mentioned that River didn't recognize the doctor. Right. That's probably my only problem with the episode. Is that River is very, very smart. Maybe actually at least sharper than the Doctor. It seems a little unbelievable that, especially with him dropping hints, that she would recognize him. Yeah, I mean, I thought of that, but I also thought, you know, she was so fixated because she had her um, little wallet of pictures. And it... Like I was thinking, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna suspend my my disbelief as far as maybe she's so honed in on these twelve pictures, and she's like, no, he can only like because she has no idea that the Time Lords came back and went through the um, the crack in the time and space and uh, gave him who knows how many more regenerations like she's not unaware of that she just knows these are the only regenerations that he can possibly have so i think her being honed in on those pictures to me allows it okay she's just kind of she's got the blinders on but yeah there is a lot of i'm the doctor things that he was throwing out right she was not picking up I mean, it basically allowed for some of the humor of not understanding. And he's like throwing out lines like, well, do you love him? And she's like, no. And the doctor at one point is like, is this what you really like when I'm not around? It was kind of amusing. Yeah, actually, um, you speaking of that, I was watching a, um, a little interviewee thing with Stephen Moffat. This is what Moffat said outside of the, the voice. He said that this is basically, and this is also not parentheses, so I just kind of wrote it down um, from memory. So this may not be exactly in his wording, internet. It says that uh, basically this is what River is like when the doctor isn't looking. Like we get to see what, um, through the doctor's eyes, 
what she's like when he's not there, even though he is kind of there. Well, he is there, but she just doesn't realize it. So we get to kind of see that aspect of it, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. It also allowed for the kind of humor of, you know, she's initially the doctor is jealous that she married King Hydroflux, and then he gets even more jealous when he learns that she was really in love with Ramon. Yes. <laughs> and we wouldn't have seen that, obviously, if she knew who he was. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And the way that he kind of uses the uh, the whole, like, marriage thing, or she uses marriage, basically using it to get further or get what she wants. Right. So I thought, yeah, I thought that was very amusing. But, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, it, it's a really, really kind of compelling way to tell the story, to tell this story of the kind of final days of the Doctor. And there's a, there's a lot of tying up of loose ends as well. I didn't catch this the first time. I watched it like three times. Wow. Yeah. And she says when um, they first meet uh, in front of the spaceship, she's, she makes like a comment about him like not be, looking like a surgeon or something like that. Or like, oh, why do you look like that? And the doctor says, I've got a new haircut and this is my very best suit. Yeah. Which is a reference to the speech, her ending speech in the library where she says, oh, he showed up with a new haircut and... A suit. A suit, yes. Yeah, and there's more. You know, the, um, she references, you know, the going to the singing towers. That was the last time she saw him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, uh, what did we think of Nardole? Eh. Matt Lucas. We've had better comic relief on the show. We, we have. Um, I think that definitely he seemed a little bit superfluous. I enjoyed him um, as somebody to kind of play off of, but because he had his moments. Probably my favorite moments was when he was really nervous um, in, in the surgeon scene or the surgery scene where he's like, "Oh, you really, you know?" They're like, do you, "You don't still think I'm a surgeon, do you?" And then he gets really nervous, and um, the doctor's like, "Don't make puddles." <laughs> I like that whole thing was really really funny. I loved it so much. That was probably about like the prime of Matt Lucas in that episode. Yeah, I mean, going all the way, you know, from Doctor Who to Shakespeare, I tend to not be a a huge fan of like the clown or the fool. Not necessarily my thing, but he was fine. Yeah, well, it, it, honestly, I think that I, this might be um, listener losing worthy. But <laughs> he was the best clown to ever clown. No, he was. I think that if he was like the kind of foil at the beginning just to get the doctor there, that whole like mistaken thing. And then they had the funny puddle scene uh, during the surgery because that actually I think added a lot. After that, maybe not so much. I know that he had some some other purposes with the robot head getting Ramon over there. But um, I think probably like his best usage, basically after he became the, the head on the on the robot, it was just a little a little on the unnecessary side for him to be there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but he was fine. I mean, yeah, it was fine. But I I, I can kind of see that it's not like I don't know, for me it, it, that was probably like some of the, some of the extra because again this episode was packed so much with a lot of fun farcical moments. So, I mean, I definitely didn't hate it, but um, like you said, Joseph, he wasn't, or we've had funnier. Mm -hmm. And more, you know, just better integrated. So, I feel like his character, for me, hit his peak at the surgery scene. Which was early. (laughs) That's that's the, like, that's the part I thought, like, he was the funniest. Mm -hmm. And and then after that, it was just sort of like, I mean, we hired We hired him now. Plateaued. So, yeah, I guess he didn't deteriorate from the episode for me, but he also didn't really... Um, he did not sad. Add. He did not you know, keep on adding, which I think was, might be good in would, an episode. Yeah, other than that, because then he just became like a really sweaty head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which was kind of unpleasant, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Nobody likes a sweaty head. Especially if all you are is a sweaty head. Yes. Eek. Eek. Where's Where's Blue Man when you need him? I know, right? Oh, now that was a head I can get behind. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's even got Wi-Fi. That's actually a thing. Because I was thinking, wow, what a horrible... Like, he seems pretty cool. Like, inside of the the suit, even when he says it's a bit whiffy down there. I always just kind of wonder, like, what are you, what are you doing down there in the suit? Well, at least I know with Dorian, he's in his box watching Netflix. Right. Because he has great Wi-Fi. Um, yes, so Puddles. That's his new name. Yes. <laughs> now, I notice that uh, when River is showing the doctor the um, the diamond the diamond in the brain. He uses his sonic sunglasses. So we thought we saw the last of the sonic sunglasses. Right. right? We, didn't, we didn't see the new screwdriver. We, we did, did once. Oh. At the end. Um, and this is the funny thing is he actually uses the new screwdriver the first time that he uses his sonic screwdriver that we see other than like, you know, cause there's a whole big, uh, to do with Clara. Um, you know, when, she, when uh, you know, she writes the thing on the on the chalkboard, you know, we're on your clever boy and be a doctor. But then all well, the music is swelling and then da, 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 and then he you know pops a screwdriver out of the console and it's like, yeah, da, 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 I'm the doctor again. Well, now he goes back to his sunglasses and we don't see the screwdriver being used until the spaceship that they're on that looks a lot like the Voyage of the Dam spaceship <laughs> is crashing and he's trying to like use it to like mend things. But it actually doesn't do anything. Like he does it still crashes. So the very first time that he uses a sonic screwdriver, it doesn't work out. It could have just everything was too far gone. I, I it just it's it's not a good uh run for the sonic screwdriver so far. It's over the <laughs> Not a good debut. <laughs> it doesn't work on metal. <laughs> Womp womp. Yes. So, and also you, you get the feeling that you know, with the speed with with the, with the speed with which they abandoned the ship, they also didn't particularly care. Not right, really. right, right. Um, they're like, yeah, okay, never mind. Let's get out of here. It's a bunch of criminals anyway. We're doing the yeah. universe a favor. Well, that was that was a, a good little scene there when they're both telling each other, especially when the doctor tells River, uh, "Your life is not worth it for saving this shipload of criminals." And that was that right. was that was good. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not necessarily doctor like, but it, it was good. Well, because well, he, he also says a, another undoctor like thing. But what were you saying, Joseph? Also, it, it it depends which doctor we're talking about. Like, yeah, it's not David Tennant like, but it's sure is fourth doctor like. Or he'll let his enemies burn, no problem. Seventh doctor. <laughs> seventh doctor. Yeah, yeah. Let, yeah. I don't care. Oh yeah, he'll let his friends burn. Absolutely. <laughs> So yeah, it's, it's it's not it's not modern doctor like, but it's definitely there's precedent for that sort of reaction. Like, eh, bad guys anyway. Bad guys anyway. Well, um, also when you consider that the spaceship that they're on is full of, I, and I'm, I'm forgetting the exact quote, but it's something to the effect of like you have to do nasty things to be here. Mm-hmm. This is the uh, this is where genocide comes to hang out or vacation or whatever even the staff have to have at least one verifiable kill yes yeah yeah so which is why that that mantis maitre d guy was so uh <laughs> was so swarmy he was kind of cool though i kind of liked his character i did i liked his character it was very um i know like there's like a very stylized character in there and um something very very interesting about his character but absolutely, I'll have to agree that um, he definitely was a bit, uh, I want to say, well, traitory, but I don't think that he's on anybody's side, so he can't really be a traitor if he's on, he's on his side. Right. He had no allegiance to yeah. Oh, well, anybody. Yes, except his own survival. Except maybe his boss. Yeah, his boss. <laughs> so he keeps his job. <laughs> right. Um, yes. So I can see in a instance like that where it's just all these like deplorable people, then you know sure the at, at the end at, in the wreckage when he's talking to the guy who, who says he can't find any survivors and the doctor says well I don't think that there's any and um, they wouldn't be worth saving if you if you did or something like that. but good on you Some, something else. somebody like, somebody cares. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm like, ooh, ooh, doctor. <laughs> okay. 
But yeah, uh, th- th- those were some uh, nasty no good nicks on that particular flight. Indeed. Indeed. Um, anyway, though, back to the um, the usage I kind of noticed about the Sonic sunglasses. Why do we have these now after this big to do? And uh, a couple things popped into my mind. Either maybe this is a new thing now. Back in in the David Tennant era, he would pop on his sunglasses or his glasses that we found out he didn't actually need. He just thought it was like it looked cool or something, made him look smarter. But this could be the kind of same thing now where he might not be using the sonic screwdriver as much or like he could just kind of be um making the sonic sun- sunglasses uh reserving them for certain tasks so maybe that's more of like the scanning and reading into things and then the sonic screwdriver could be like for fixing bits because it's always been problematic when the doctor looks at the screwdriver as though he's reading something on it. Yeah. When it's clearly just a couple blinky lights. Well, no, but we said, we said this before on the podcast. Clearly, with, especially the 11th Doctor, would scan and then be able to get something from looking at it. Something we couldn't quite make out. But right. there's something... Even the ninth Doctor uses a, is a scanner, I think, at one point eventually. Well, I know that he's used it as a scanner before. The, uh, the 10th Doctor kind of listen to it like he would like go and then like hold it up to his like ear to, as if it was like like re- reading like, back to him yeah reading back or there's like a signal or something like <clears throat> that um yeah it wasn't until the the 11th doctor where he actually like, looked at it like there's like a readout um but i don't know so yeah maybe this one is uh, a double act but also i think that it kind of played more as a plot device as a storytelling vehicle that if he whipped out that sonic screwdriver, then that would have been like a dead indicator for, for river other than the doctor going, I'm the doctor. (laughs) I am the doctor, (laughs) but that wasn't working. But I would think that if maybe he like, we had whipped out a sonic screwdriver, then that might've been a little bit too clear. Like, okay, okay. I know a guy with the sonic screwdriver. (laughs) One guy. Did you take it from him? (laughs) <laughs> that probably would have been the next thing. Sonic shovel, Sonic trowel, trowel. I like the tr- the trowel. That was funny. And trowel is just funny. That's a good word. And it made me think of uh, Mr. Pond, Arthur Pond. No, Ar- Arthur. No, yes, Arthur Darville. Arthur Darville. Arthur Weasley. <laughs> Dad. 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 Dad Williams. Yes. Um, Brian. I think it was Brian. Uh, yeah, Brian. Brian, Brian Williams. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, the, the trowel was, was funny, and it's funny the doctor was like, supposedly the reason why he gave her a screwdriver was he found the trowel embarrassing. Yes. <laughs> so, but that's cool. I mean, basically, the doctor gets his screwdrivers from the TARDIS console, uh, but we've seen both River and before that Amy construct sonic devices. So they can be constructed. Mm-hmm. The, the doctor just has a faster way to it. Yeah, because we had. Oh, didn't uh, Sarah Jane also do lipstick or something? Sarah, but didn't did the doctor give that to her, or maybe her computer? Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Smith did. So the only other sonic devices we've seen are Jack's blaster and um, the woman in the adipose. She had a sonic pen. Oh yes, um, <clears throat> Mrs. Foster, Miss Foster, whatever. Yeah. So it's a, it does seem like that sonic technology is not like a time lord thing. It's just useful right but my point and is the doctors may be souped up in maze that the other ones aren't so so we don't have evidence that river invented the thing but we do have evidence that amy built it from scratch right oh absolutely yeah yeah so amy's quite intelligent she maybe she's also been exposed to the schism right so this is a bit off topic but we've i've been having this conversation i think with at least joseph because I've, I've been watching some of the older Davy stuff. Yeah, oh. And it was it was really nice that the companions were just people. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like Rose was just some girl who worked in a shop. Uh, Martha, obviously, was, was a doctor. So she was very smart. But Donna was you know, another just secretary. And it's not until the Moffat era that we have the girl who grew up with a crack in her bedroom wall. Or we have, you know, the impossible companion. It's kind of nice. I hope the next companion is just a... Uh, Regular folk. Oh, don't worry. She won't be. (laughs) (laughs) 
It'll be like uh, the doctor's high school girlfriend or something. I don't know. <laughs> or high school boyfriend. Academy. Academy boyfriend. Academy, yes. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's going to be... I feel like, as you were remarking, uh, Gabe, that TV is going in a, in a new, different direction. And possibly gone are the days where the companion is just somebody helping out the doctor or, or or just merely a friend of the doctor it's somebody who has to be like involved so hard in his life well no and i think maybe though to counteract what i just said things always happen in cycles so they like they're a certain way until we get tired of them and then they're like oh here's this new idea that <laughs> that we used to do so it's a new old idea. A new old idea. But yes, I I agree. I think that it would be nice if not everything had like such a huge, huge weight other than what is the story arc this season. Yeah. And it, it is actually kind of funny when you think about it, like going back to the classic era, uh, and I'm thinking specifically of Dragonfire, where there's like a the change out of Companions, where Mel was just like, you know what, Doctor, I don't know if I want to travel with you anymore. And then he's like, okay, go ha- go on with Glitz. <laughs> that sounds like a much better <laughs> thing. <laughs> like, hey, uh, Ace, would you you want to go ahead and uh, travel with me around the universe? Okay, Professor. On one account, you'd never call me Professor. <laughs> <laughs> so, come, come on, Ace. <laughs> yes. So, and we don't know what happens to her because she uses the se- series abruptly ending, and so we don't know what her handoff is. Ideally, <laughs> uh, and this is going from like the back, you know, in between stories. Um, originally, her her idea was that she was supposed to go off and uh, go to Gallifrey because she wanted to go to Gallifrey and be part of the council. Oh, wow! And so she was going to be like <laughs> part of. Uh, she's gonna be kind of be a time lord, just in name, time lady, time lady. Or, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. she if she could be exposed to the schism. I don't know. It, it's not clear if it has to be done. Like you I know, keep on saying schism. It's like vort- schism is fun to the, say. The un- untempered schism is the yes. thing that yeah that you look into that you see the all of the vortex. And you go, you go insane. She wants to be insane. But um, that was the original like kind of plot was or her story arc. If they were going to keep on going was that she was just going to end there and go off to Gallifrey and um, be maybe either... Or maybe just an honorary time order. I don't know how it works. But that was the idea. Well, we know Ace appears in Big Finish audio dramas. So there's um, there's more story to be told. We've heard at least one of them. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Yeah. But was that one of those crazy crossovers where it was like all of them? Yeah, 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 I think it was. was. So not much can be gleaned from that. Yeah, and then the next, the Seventh Doctor's next companion was going to be like a cat burglar, like you see, you know, like an park. actual cat, like a like a <laughs> cat woman cat. You know, like, like the Seventh Doctors. The Seventh, yeah, it was going to start like she's at a party, like some ritzy party, and then like she's like cracking open a safe, and then the safe door opens, and then the Seventh Doctor's in there, like hello. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's all part of the. Um, the survival DVDs that you can get. Oh, mm. see, when you said you said cat burglar, I thought it was actually a survival thing. Like it was actually going to be a. Cat. Oh yeah, no, yeah. No, <laughs> it was, it was, if you get those DVDs, and there's the special features of like what would have happened afterwards. So, but um, yeah. Back to, uh... back to back to Christmas. <laughs> By the way, this was surprisingly more Christmassy than I thought. I was getting ready for like a zero Christmas. The way that Moffat was building it up was that it sounded like he was going to be moping around for like the first half and like Christmas was going on or something and then um, River was going to come and then he's gonna, like then they're going to ignore Christmas and then you know who knows what was going to happen. But there was really no sad doctor moping and there was no I think that they kind of embraced christmas a bit here there are no starbucks they are no (laughs) no um no i I thought there was a bit of moping there was the first few minutes but really except for the fact that it's set on christmas i wouldn't say they embrace it 
nor, nor do they run from it. It just uh, it's I don't know, it's it's more apparent than other episodes. Yes. Um, it's 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 woven in there quite um, quite evenly. I think it was snowing. It was snowing. Yes, he wore reindeer hat. There was one or more yeah. colored lights. There were, especially at the end. That was quite festive. So what did you think of uh, Greg Davies as King Hydroflux? I, I really liked him. And another thing I was thinking about was, I wonder what it's like acting with your body inside the TARDIS console. <laughs> <laughs> There's like, it's like that's got to be a very unique opportunity because yeah his head is there it's on the TARDIS console and he's talking and it's like obviously it's just it's a thing around his neck Mm -hmm. and he's talking and doing his lines and acting but his body is like inside the console so that's got to be like a first I would think I don't know if uh if android person handles or not (laughs) handles handles and the blue guy Dorian. Dorian. But I think he was always in his box, wasn't he? Yeah, he was in his box, but he was on the... I don't know if he was on the console. I think he was on a, on a, a chair. chair. Yeah. yeah. So, um... And also Handles is not a person, so... I'm guessing but, it was an easier effect know, to pull off. The, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking of the, the fifth Doctor Android person. Oh, Chameleon? Chameleon, yes. Well, Chameleon was uh, actually a prop. It wasn't a person. Oh, okay. It wasn't that the whole thing that it was like just this incredibly unwieldy... Uh, Puppet, thing. right? They, they said they could do that now with technology, but back in that day, it was virtually impossible. But given their technical limitations, uh, so maybe we'll see a version of Chameleon. Maybe I hope not. <laughs> the fans are clamoring. Yeah, I, I thought Greg Davies was uh, basically nailed it as Davies. Oh, <laughs> he basically nailed it as your stereotypical uh, bombastic kingly villain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah, he was great because, and again, he wasn't like so like insanely evil too. He wasn't really really dark. He was he was bombastic exactly. So obviously he was putting people in the position of you know gross injustices and um, threatening people. So there's definite danger. But it was so over the top that it was like kind of funny, so you didn't really worry about that. Maybe in the way of like they weren't as sinister as the uh, the hand the, the the stream crabs from last Christmas, where it it looked creepy and horrible and like a horror film. So I'm glad. Thank you, Stephen Moffat, for not making this Christmas a horror film <laughs> for once. Um, oh, another thing though about the uh, that I kind of noticed about just the villains in general was they weren't like a like overall in the whole scheme of the story it wasn't really about them like they were just sort of there because it really the resolution to the villains wasn't like that big. He, the doctor like firewalled the uh, the robot and then just kind of repurposed, deleting all the bad bits. Well, I mean, no, so, so R- River saves the day because as we've seen her do before, she purposely picked this spot at this time, knowing there'd be a meteor shower. Right. So it's the uh, I'm a time traveler. I win. Ha ha. Yes. So I mean, so that is that is clever on her part. And yeah, but yeah, yeah. The, there is not necessarily a villain that was. A antagonist, yeah, yeah, and not like to the end where it's just like once they you know overthrow the villain, then that's that's the climax of the story. Like, but I, I did really enjoy the turnabout when the one dude was buying this diamonds to honor King Hydroflux. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and, oops, and the doctor is trying very very hard to to stall. That was good. Oh, that yeah, I mean it was really really funny. It's like okay, here you go, here, here here's the diamonds. And then they figure out, like, oh, okay, well, we love, we do this in honor of the king. And, like, yay, maybe we should not have, you should not have that. <laughs> and, actually, this was very farcical. This is a very farcical Christmas special. It, like, had, like, all those elements of farce where uh, there's uh, misinformation, um, uh, mistaken identities, yeah, 
that whole thing. I mean, the, that that's a lot in a of what kind of makes a farce. There's even some door slamming bits. I will I'll give them the door slamming bits when they're um, in the spaceship, and it's just they're like, what am I thinking of the uh, transmorph or materializing in front of the doctor materializes around river, and then. Like she runs out and then he pulls it. Or like all the, the, so, the, big, the way around, yeah. she goes to the TARDIS and materializes around him. Oh, yeah. And he was like, River, no. But then, yeah, yeah, they were kind of running circles trying to save each other. Very farcical. You said it better. You say things better than I do, Gabe. N- no, I, I didn't even come up with the word farcical, so. Okay. This is supposedly the last time. That River sees the doctor before going to the library. Right. But we have a little bit of wiggle room here because we learn that it's the last night of her life, but one night on Delirium lasts 24 years. Yes. It's one of those rare times where science fiction recognizes that all planets spin at the same speed. (laughs) Right. And one of the things that I really enjoyed, uh, which also kind of made me... Uh, wonder about the the twenty four years thing. So the part where um, the doctor was just he kept on going like a little bit ahead in time to build the restaurant, right? Uh, and they realized, oh, it, it, it crash landed in the in front of the the singing towers of Darillion. Um He goes on the to the TARDIS and then just like. Says, hey, uh, you should build a, uh, a restaurant right here, and then goes back, and then walks back, and then oh, um, sweet restaurant, oh, uh, reservations not till four years from now. All right, no problem. So it's just like a little bit each time, a long, a long bit in that one case because four years yeah. on Derlium would be something like seven or eight thousand years. In, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and the second poll was longer than the first. Clearly, the first poll was oh, like, yeah, yeah. It was like it was. It was actually kind of funny to see him like engage the TARDIS and immediately disengage. Yeah, so it's just it like kind of because because it doesn't even get that second whoosh. Well, no, we don't know how long a year is because a year and a day don't bear, don't have no bearing. So we don't know how long it takes to really go run once around its sun. But I'm guessing it's still going to be longer than four years for you know yeah. 365 day Earth years. Yeah. Th- there are planets. That have longer days than orbits around their star, though. Yes, that is true. Um, yes, but there's really no way to know. Unfortunately, yes. four four derulium years without knowing <laughs> the orbital period is impossible to determine based on the length of its day, unless the planet is tidally locked, in which case we know that one of its days is forty eight years. Hmm. <clears throat> so, but if it's tidally locked, with someone never set, so that doesn't work. <laughs> so um, I, I'm curious about this whole like the mythology of the diary because in the episode river says that um talking to the doctor this diary she's sad because it's almost filled um it's all almost all full and uh it's sad and the doctor seems to be kind of be in the dark he's like yeah so unless he was just sort of trying to work something out of her that he already knew but um you know, she tells him that uh, the reason why she's sad is because this uh, the, the man who gave it to her knew how long the diary was, uh, or how long of a diary she need, and I'm curious about that. If that's, it, it seems like he just kind of picked up the diary because he saw, he saw that that was the diary that she had originally, which brings all kinds of bootstrap paradoxes into this. <laughs> Get your uh, Beethoven's uh, busts ready. But um, it seems like the diary and the screwdriver he got because he saw a river with it originally. So that's why he got it to him. So, yeah, that, wh- who, who got the idea to give it to her? Well, in the case of the screwdriver, it's established by River in the library that the last night she sees him is that time they go to the towers. Right. And it's established during the episode that the doctor keeps delaying taking her there. Right. So when the doctor realizes he can no longer, you know, fight her fate, he realizes he must give her the screwdriver now to fulfill that. Yes. 
Otherwise, it could, you know, potentially damage time. Now, note about that. Um, a lot of that is being pulled from the mini-sodes that happen in the um, uh, Series 6. Which is really difficult to find on the, the Blu-rays, on the DVD. I couldn't find them. Hmm. I searched. I went through every single disc. I missed them somehow. But Are they hidden Easter eggs? No. They're, um, they're all on there. I believe that they all should be on there. Um, maybe. I don't know. Maybe they're hidden. I don't know. I, looked on the, I tried looking on the internet. Like Even Wikipedia is like, oh, yeah, this is... They're included in this disc. And the only one that I could find was the freaking closing time one. Anyway, that's the side note that made me angry. I had to end up looking up on, and watching online. The only ones that they had on YouTube was somebody actually filming them with their Android phone. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, thank you. Luckily, <laughs> Daily Motion came in with the save. But um, so there's. The uh, the references the first night and last night, which kind of uh, tells the story of River Song, and what's supposed to be you know the going to Derillium, and in that sequence because she um, says oh yeah in, in this episode in the Christmas special she's like oh yeah that's when there was two of you, um, you're supposed to take me but you know you canceled, and I I really think. Uh, because Moffat even just said, I wrote this episode because I thought, oh, I might not get another chance to write River. So obviously he had no idea that this was going to happen. So the original idea was we see it in the, the little minisodes where there's the two doctors talking to each other. And he says to the other doctor, like, oh, we're go- you're going to Derillium. When I was in the library, River told me that that's where I took her is is this the last night? And then the doctor looks at other doctor and says, spoilers, and then leaves. So, I th- I mean, it, it's kind of interesting that they had that whole moment set up. He left that, like, little out. It wasn't exactly like a yes or a no thing, which is definitely him. But um, whatever moment that they had there, obviously that was supposed to be at that moment yeah, this is that time. And it was completely squashed with him going, yeah, they canceled. <laughs> they just canceled that. So all that all that drama that you saw in that little mini-sode was just squashed. But, again, Moffat did, did leave that out. Well, one, one nice thing... I mean, clearly we already established this season the Doctor hates endings. So it makes yeah. sense... And we've seen that before. So it makes sense that he would keep delaying the last time he would see her because he didn't yeah. want to say goodbye. Yeah. And it was actually a pretty rare moment at that last moment when you see the doctor crying. Right. To see that much emotion for, you know, anybody. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was good. I mean, it was, it was sad, but it was, still, it was still nice. That whole scene on the balcony was so... Like, it was so many things. It was sweet it was sad it was also kind of reassuring and hopeful and again he kind of plays the point the part of the um the of river in this episode he also kind of you know for for the beginning part and i know we kind of like blew past this but um he he does play the part of the companion and actually gets to do his own tardis entry I thought that was very charming. Him walking in is like, oh, this is my go. And I would have actually thought that was one of those moments that he was overacting so much that she might look back and be like, doctor? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, just because nobody has ever reacted that way. And then he's like, oh, no, this is just how I do it. This is... <laughs> I just wanted to uh, see it done properly. <laughs> she was more worried about writing the liquor cabinet to get yes. the... She keeps booze in the TARDIS. <laughs> I like it. Um, oh, I failed. The TARDIS melted inside my whiskey. Oh. Oh, bum, 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 To be bum. continued. Drink more whiskey is what I'm saying. Okay. But yeah, uh, there is something kind of reassuring, though, about that that balcony scene. Because we do know that even though 
that's the night that they kind of actually that's their last actual night that they spend together the next time they see each other is in the library and he does save her right to the drive and she goes on further adventures after that so uh, as a hologram in the to Trenzalar so it is kind of interesting where he does say, you know, this has to happen. Maybe even from a, this is a fixed point, this has to happen kind of way. But he also knew inherently that he keep delaying to a certain point. Yeah. And, you know, wait till he absolutely couldn't delay any, any longer. Right. Right. So maybe he kind of used the uh, diary as a timekeeper. Like, oh, she's only like halfway through the, the diary. There's still lots more to do. Well, plus, you know, it's through her doing that that ship's crashing there. That's true. Not the doctors. So it is inevitable. An inevitability. So many things tying up. There it is. All in a nice Christmas bow for you. I thought, yeah, fantastic episode. I, I couldn't like it more. Really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. It was good. And it'll be too late for our listeners, but for the next two days, it is screening in cinemas across the U.S. For the next two days? Yes. Oh, maybe I should see cinemas. With a behind-the-scenes featurette. (gasps) Not counting. Today is not one of the days, right? Um, I think it's tomorrow and the day after. Okay. Who knows? Who knows what the future holds? It's a crazy old world out there. Doctor Who knows. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, um, is that about it for this podcast? I think so. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. I like it. I like it. Uh, so, Gabe, would you like to say the magic words? Do you have a Hootube app? I do have a Hootube. Actually, no, I don't have a Hootube. I have two Hootubes. Two for the price of one. So, actually, one of them is one that you picked out for me. Oh, nice. I enjoyed that one. I thought it was good. I liked it too, which is why I asked if we did it. <laughs> yeah, no, we have I, sh- I should know. <laughs> um, this, and that one is called uh, River Song Fan Music Video by Richard Pierce. And um, it's more kind of focuses on the six series, but it's really, really good. It, it you know, kind of has a lot of, you know, a lot of river, very, very nice kind of, you know, memory type song. Um Anyway, yeah, go check it out. You will you will be um, pleased with it. We I hope. Thought. We hope. We hope. If not, no refunds. Um, then the one that I really enjoyed, uh, which because I kind of this is our Christmas special, so I wanted to have um, a Christmas one, and I really got into the song by Owl City called Peppermint Winter. This year, I just discovered it, and. Lo and behold, several years ago, somebody came up with a Peppermint Winter Doctor Who Christmas video, uh, which has a plethora of Doctors, including one that's not used a lot, but the Ninth Doctor in um, the Unquite Dead, which I, even though it's kind of the apocrypha of Christmas specials, I... I um, Except I embrace it as a Christmas special. Well, check those out. Check those out. Um, and so it's Peppermint Winter, Doctor Who, by Sparky Dragon Slayer. And we will have those for you up on our website, which you can find at www.aotpodcast.com. I said www. because I said at before that, and I didn't want anybody to think it was our, our Twitter, which our Twitter is at AOT Podcast. Clever. Um, and that's where you can hate us. And then... <laughs> Please love us on iTunes. Yeah. Love us on iTunes um, and Stitcher. Or Stitcher. Or both. Or you could uh, jaunt over to our Musings of a Geek uh, network. That's where we're at. Uh, musingsofageek.com where you can have all kinds of other podcast experiences. Just like uh, 14 going on 40. Or the... Uh, Pretty Angels, Dark Angels, Pretty Freaks, sorry. The Arkham Social Hour? Uh, Arkham Social Hour, and of course the flagship podcast, musingsofageek.com. And 
No, sorry, Musings of a Geek podcast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, you can check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash AOT podcast, and you can listen to our podcast there because we have we're doing that thing now, as well as our Facebook page. Just search Arrow of Time on Facebook. <laughs> I think that covers all the bits. The bits are covered. The bits are covered. As they should be. As they should be. It's cold outside. It is. It is cold outside. All right. Well, with that, I have been Matt. I have been Joseph. I have been Gabe. And this has been The Arrow of Time. That's a wrap. That is a wrap. And a torta. <laughs> kind of hungry now. Torta sounds good. You just had a sandwich. I did. <laughs> I want more sandwiches from different cultures. <laughs> so this is a baguette? Yes. You are now leading the world of Musings of a Geek podcast network. Stay geeky, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>